Professor Kwan's the Head of Respiratory and Sleep Medicine at Sutherland Hospital, as well as Senior Staff Specialist at St Vincent's Hospital. <clears throat> After completing respiratory and sleep medicine training at Prince of Wales, he undertook a PhD in upper airway physiology and ultrasound. And he's got particular interest in the field of sleep apnea and physiology, smoking cessation and lung cancer, lung ultrasound, pleural diseases, and new models of care in respiratory and sleep medicine. He's very passionate about education and he's received several student teaching awards and he's convened national and international courses, as well as being part of the Education Committee of the Thoracic Society of Australia and the Australasian Society of Sleep Medicine. And Professor Kwan's also published quite widely, including articles in very prestigious journals, such as New England Journal of Medicine and JAMA. And it's also co-authored co -authored statewide guidelines and even including our GP health pathways. And additionally, he is involved in research, including at present um, multi-centre studies in the field of smoking cessation, malignant pleural effusions, airway diseases, and respiratory supportive care. So with this wealth of experience, and particularly because it's been such a busy time lately for respiratory physicians, we were very, very grateful that he's agreed to come along and talk tonight and give us a respiratory update. So welcome, Professor Kwan. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for, um, for the introduction and uh, welcome everybody. Um, to come to join us for a talk today. So what we'd like to do um, is really to look at respiratory uh, update, um, focusing on four area, which we're going to look at asthma, COPD, IOD, and then the end we'll go to COVID and there'll be time for questioning, um, question and answers in the end. So, um, so just uh, starting, um, I hope you can see the screen. So first off is to talk about, you know, as I said, immunotherapy and asthma, what is new there? What well, the new medication in terms of the asthma space and COPD space and IOD space. And then we talk about some of the recovery management of patients um, and when to refer. So asthma. So as we know in asthma, it is defined clinically as a combination of respiratory symptoms and excessive variation in lung function. So from that perspective, it's important for us to look at um, is, uh, the history, um, especially of um, any particular trigger factors, um, smoking history. We also look at from the examination perspective, as well as documenting the variable airflow limitation, which one of the many tools could be a peak flow, um, but better still would be a spirometry result. Um, and it is important for us that to understand that at the moment, there's not really a gold standard uh, or single reliable test that can tell someone whether they have got um, asthma or not. It is a combination of all this that give us a, um, a confidence in uh, describing the phenotype of the patient. There are various different you know, international and local guidelines looking at asthma, and I would I uh, suggest that you know, if you have time and interest in this area, look at the GINA guideline, which is a global um, initiative for asthma management, uh, as, as well as the asthma handbook, which is the Australian guideline that we are looking at now. So if you look at the GINA guideline, you know, in terms of uh, the definition, then it is a heterogeneous disease. And it, um, the characteristic is really this chronic um, airway uh, inflammation. So besides the history of the symptoms that we're looking at in terms of wheeze, breathlessness, chest tightness and cough, uh, we really want to look at is that variable expiratory airflow limitation. The symptom of asthma is important to understand that it's usually reversible either spontaneously or with treatment, but sometimes it can be then being questioned uh, or remission for weeks or months and then it triggers off again. Sometimes and in a frequent or infrequently in some of our patients, especially with the moderate to severe diseases um, or more persistent type of asthma diseases, they can be have very significant adverse effects on their life, um, especially quality of life, work, um, schooling, education, etc. Um, and some patients obviously have kind of life threatening asthma and mortality rate is still present. Now it is important to look at asthma. It is really should be thinking of as a chronic, not an acute condition. And these two graphs, you know, is quite nicely demonstrating a few things for us. Number one, it is about preventative uh, versus a short acting reliever. We know that in Australia, uh, especially in Australia, there has been a very high reliance on short acting beta agonist as a monotherapy, especially in those patients we classify as mild intermittent asthma or very mild or, or just mildly symptomatic. But the problem with that is the fact that two things. Number one, we know that patients often underestimate um, the severity of the attack. And two, they also overestimate how well controlled the symptom is. So often when we ask a patient, do you think you got good control? Most people tell us that they are good. 
But in effect, we know that you know if we look and um, specifically on the symptom score, and looking at the control very clearly, um, looking at you know symptoms, looking at frequency of using um, relief medication, a high number of our patients actually have suboptimal control. And what then we find out along the way as well is that if um, if a patient rely on just short acting beta agonists in the cell to control their intermittent or mild intermittent asthma. Uh, it's actually quite frequent um, that the, the more canister of um, salivar that they use, the property of survival you can see in the top graph drops. So, and um, whilst interestingly, the more canister of inhaled corticosteroid a patient will use per year, in the bottom graph you can see the ratio of death from the asthma drops significantly. And that comes to the point that asthma, being a variable airway disease, has the origin in that inflam airway inflammation that we talked about before. Um, and this is why it is important that the asthma guidelines has now been changed to recommend the fact that in patients who have got really mild um, intermittent asthma, uh, and that way you can step down the control, majority of patients really wouldn't require ICS uh, rather than a SABA as a monotherapy. So other things that we want to look through is also the, in terms of the GINA guideline, and this is here about assessment of control. And this is actually quite a good, neat way for um, us to uh, tick box or easily to look at how well controlled the patient is just based on a few simple criteria. So asthma and COPD, much like other diseases now, is about personalizing the treatment. And in this case, you can see that in terms of asthma, Con symptom control, which is a key point of all of our patients, we really want to just focus on the four weeks, um, perhaps where they got daytime symptoms, nighttime symptoms, how often do they use the acute reliever and any active limitation. So that is telling us about control. The second thing that we want to look at for our patient then is to assess for risk factor that may prompt a poor outcome. So again, we're looking at exacerbation risk. We're looking at severity risk. So for example, and you can see here, other things important would be, for example, do they have comorbidity that would uh, means a more a likely chance of exacerbation and a poor outcome, such as um, GORD or chronic rhinosinusitis. Do they use this particular medication frequently, such as the high number of SABA usage? What about exposure? For example, to smoking, allergens, um, as well as air pollution, but can it be controlled or can it, can it be difficult to control? The lung function is important um, and other inflammatory marker and biomarkers that we are now beginning to look at, uh, which uh, would give us a degree of risk and the phenotype of the patient. And in particular, we're going to talk about is eosinophil. So, from through there, what we then want to do is the phenotyping the patients in terms of their symptom and the severity and come up with a, a degree of understanding that is some, as a patient has got good control, suboptimal control or poor control. So we're looking at those uncontrolled asthma in terms of the definition and in terms of the exacerbation and looking at even further defining how serious is the exacerbation. Are they minor or mild treated in the community? Or are they, do they ultimately result in hospitalization? Um, and do they need prolonged courses of oral corticosteroid? And do they have intubation or NIV, non-invasive ventilation requirement um, during the hospitalization? And then, then look at also the severity of the airflow um, and narrowing that they, they have got. So it is then important then for us to understand what is the differences between someone who has got poor control versus severe asthma. Because severe asthma is really a phenotype uh, um, that we want to describe in someone who has got symptoms and or exacerbation that remain uncontrolled despite addressing all the potential contributing factors. For example, smoking, allergens exposure, um, you know, the compliance, the technique, et cetera. And that's really only around three to 10% of the adult asthma population. 
this is severe asthma. Whereas uncontrolled asthma, we talked about before, is really just asthma that is you no, know, it is poor symptom control with frequent exacerbation or flare up, um, um, or serious exacerbation. Now you can have severe asthma, poorly controlled, or you could have mild asthma but poorly controlled. Um, so it is important for us to understand that because when someone is classified as a severe asthmatic and they have got other phenotypes and biomarkers that potentially we can address that open up um, further potential treatment um, paradigms that we can look at. And this severe asthmatic or very difficult to treat asthmatic really require specialist and multidisciplinary approach because it's usually not just one thing um, that would tilt the patient off to a suboptimal or poor control or frequent exacerbation. And we may have to tackle multiple different domains um, and it could be lifestyle factor modification, it could be environmental, um, and it could be medication technique, et cetera, to try to address it. So just to remind us, this is the latest um, guideline in terms of the GINA guideline looking at adult and adolescents, 12 plus years, about personalizing the asthma management. Majority of our patients would really be in the step three or step two processes. You can see in here, there are two um, pathway. Uh, so it's important that in any patient, we assess, adjust and review over time. But the first is the controller with a preferred reliever. And you can see in step one and two, in a patient who got really low uh, risk of exacerbation, in frequent exacerbation of very well symptom control, you can step them down to really only as a PRN, low dose ICS afomotro, because afomotro is a long acting beta agonist that can also have a rapid onset of action. Um, in reality, the medication that we're looking at, at that in the PRM is a simple called medication because it's afomotro with the budesonide. Um, and then if you are a patient who got more exacerbation or more, um, a, a more severe phenotype or less well control, you would not rather than PRN, you will go into a maintenance regular dosage. And then you step up the ladder, as you can see, depending on the exacerbation risk, risk factor, as well as um, the severity. The alternative would be a controller with an alternative reliever. So if you don't want to use a sing one single age um, combined medication, you can have a patient on a low dose maintenance ICS, or if they're really well controlled, if they just really like their Sabra, such as salbutamol, it will suggest to them that, well, when you take that, you should also take an ICS at the same time to reduce that, um, that risk uh, and the mortality benefit that we can see before in the graph. So it can be your choice. Um, you can take a you know once a day type of um, a inhaled corticosteroid, or there are of course the morning and night type of inhaled corticosteroid. But when they use the the saba, they should then take it um, because obviously when they're taking the saba, that means that they are having symptoms, which could potentially you know pointing towards a um, a con well, that they need to improve the control. They're having a heralding a potential exacerbation that is coming. There are other control options for either track, as you can see in the bottom. Sometimes why would we change that? It could be because the patients could not tolerate the side effects of um, ALABA. So we may have to look at, you know, other type, you know, of medication it could be a long acting muscarinic antagonist, ALAMA, or it could be a leukotriene receptor antagonist instead um, that, you know, so we try to still maintain control, but use alternative depending um, on um, the patient's need. And this is, you know, kind of another graph that kind of show us, you know, really what about uncontrolled asthma as to how we should approach this. So you can see here when we identify a patient with uncontrolled asthma, despite the high dose medication, we will have to first reassess, look at the risk of a first event, reevaluate whether there's any alternative diagnosis, look at the technique, look at the compliance, support them if we can modify risk factor. And then we can look at phenotyping whether or not if they're still symptomatic, add on treatment such as tautropium 
um, or potentially other medications such as azithromycin in certain pop, um, certain um, population in terms of first frequency exacerbation. Uh, and then we can look at this um, medication such as biologics, which we'll talk about before. So just going back to here now, so this is the important understanding about biologics. So why does this the whole, um, all this talk now about biologics, um, a new kind of a treatment for severe asthma? And that's because airway inflammation is um, quite heterogeneous among patients uh, with asthma. You can see in this uh, um, diagram here, there is really two types of uh, airway inflammation that can exist in our asthmatic patient. One could be an allergic eosinophilic type of airway inflammation, whereas the other is more of a non-allergic non -allergic eosinophilic airway inflammation. And you can see that there are certain different types of cytokines and, you know, and T and B cells in responses to innate and as well as also of his, our, our autoantibodies, sorry, our antibody resp mediated responses to the exposure to either allergens or pollutants, microbes, or glycolipids. Um, so in patients who have got the eosinophilic inflammation, that link to the, uh, to the responses um, does matter. And it does can uh, work out what treatment potentially we can use in these patients. So that's why it is important when we have a severe asthmatic that we will look at um, certain biomarkers, in particular eosinophil count, as well as their IgE level to see whether perhaps we can look at targeting those two pathways to control that severe um, um, asthma phenotype that the patient has. So that means that, you know, in our patient, we've got persistent uncontrolled asthma. This is why it's important that we tailor the treatment. If we find that, the, that a patient has got a raised IgE, then we can look at an anti-IgE therapy such as omonizumab. Um, as you know, uh, uh, to, to, and to look at that as a, um, to try to mop up the excess IgE so it doesn't trigger that um, allergic eosinophilic pathway. But for patients who have got allergic or non-allergic type of eosinophilic airway inflammation, so that means that that eosinophil is high, more than 0.3 or 300 cells per microliter, then potentially looking back through this diagram again, in the middle here, you can see the eosinophil in the middle, and then on both sides, you can see it's IL-5 and IL-13 pathway. So then we can look at using the anti-IL-5 or anti-IL-5R medication, such as meponisumab, benradisumab. Um, they both of them are in this country and to, to, to use um, in order to dampen down um, that, uh, that pathway and the, act, uh, the action. There is also an anti-IL4RA medication, dupilumab, that has some activity in our IL4, IL13 pathway. So looking back at this diagram, to the left side of the diagram, you can see in the TH2 cells mediating the activation of mast cells and the B cells to release the IgE that relies on the IL4, IL13, as well as the copper cells um, activation. But in, um, in the current, um, uh, uh, PBS funding uh, for, um, for medication, the anti-IL4-RA is only funded for atopic dermatitis. Um, but patients who got atopic dermatitis and asthma, which can occur in um, combination because it's an allergic um, pathway, then you can use dupilumab as an alternative medication. So persistent uncontrolled asthma, what do we do? We really now looking at the bottom diagram, trying to monitor those treatable traits. Do we have an inflammation predominant diseases? Do we have more of a severe concordant type that's other medication potentially could work? Or do we just look at treating them for symptom management or do they have frequent exacerbation, especially bacterium, and then whether antibiotic therapy may be beneficial. Last but not least, because Sutherland Hospital is one of the three sites in the state, also actually maybe four now, um, that could have, and uh, is part of a, um, a uh, um, study looking at bronchial thermoplasty, which is a mechanical way of delivering heat to the airway, which reduces then this increased mass of the airway's roof muscle. So essentially kind of burning um, and, and, uh, and scarring the airway and therefore 
Um, you can see on the diagram on the bottom right, uh, when you apply thermal heat, um, it just reduces that airway thickening. And so the suitable patient really require um, uh, a revaluation to see where they may actually have those phenotypes that we described before, um, and therefore more appropriate for a biologic rather than a bronchial thermoplasty. Um, but Sutherland Hospital, you know, severe asthma entity, we can offer this patient some of this role, and there's uh, only about four or five patients in the Shire that has um, bronchial thermoplasty, and this is an ongoing treatment trial that, um, that we're collecting. Okay, so we will go to COPD, um, and then I don't mind putting a slight pause and looking, getting some questions um, at that time. So COPD. So it is important to recognize, obviously, from COPD point of view, that it is, again, it could be a heterogeneous diseases across a spectrum. What we want to look at is really patients who have got dyspnea that is progressive over time and characteristically worse with exercises. They may have chronic cough, they may not. They may have chronic sputum production. Remember, this is a spectrum um, and a recurrent infection or other risk factor in particular, you know, inhalational agents such as tobacco or it could be, um, you know, pollution, et cetera, that could um, cause, uh, can activate, I suppose, and, and lead on for the patient to have this chronic inflammatory um, condition. And what we now want to look at in terms of the COPD side of things is to redefine the way that we assess our COPD patients. And again, personalizing our treatment to them by categorizing them into kind of traits of phenotype. So firstly, we need to, to identify that they have had exposure to a toxic um, a chemical. It could be smoking, it could be pollutant. And then we would perform, they will have symptoms and then we would perform spirometry to confirm the diagnosis by looking at the FEV1 and the FEV1 over FEC ratio to look at less than 0.7 or 70%. And then we will assess the error limitation basing on the above to divide them into severity. So this is the, um, the, um, the GOLD guideline, which is the Global Obstructive Lung Diseases um, Initiative. And this is, you can see, they defined it if a patient has symptoms, spirometric confirmed diagnosis, and they have got um, exposure to a previous um, aero, uh, uh, a toxic um, uh, allergens, uh, sorry, um, toxic um, chemical such as tobacco. Then they will split it into three or four different class, go class one, class two, class three, and class four. Then after that, so that defines their grade or severity, then we look at the uh, exacerbation history. Do they have a are they the frequent exacerbator phenotype or they are not? Um, and do they have a severe exacerbation phenotype? Again, that means intensive care admission or hospitalization or um, ICU admission or NIV slash mechanical ventilation. Then we can use various different tools to help us assess their symptom. Um, such as you can see here, um, in here in terms of the ABCD assessment tool and combining that with some objective scores such as CAT score um, or the MMRC. So what is the MMRC? So that's the modified MMRC dyspnea scale. It's quite, sim um, quite simple. It's a great zero to four, really just asking the patient to tick, do they only, did, where do they get breathless and how limited is the activity? And this is the CAT assessment, both a validated two to look at COPD patients in terms of symptom assessment. And this in here is really looking at um, the uh, uh, seven domains. You can see cough, phlegm, you know, tightness of the chest, um, uh, the eight, eight domains, sorry, um, walking up the hill in terms of breathlessness or not, uh, activity limitation, um, and uh, the sleep and the energy level as well as the obviously um, how, pre how common they are to leave the home. And basing on um, the uh, exacerbation risk, as well as this symptomatic score, um, and after the grading, we will start looking and splitting them into four groups. Those who have not much symptom and not much exacerbation, so group A, which you can just use a bronchodilator as an initial way to help manage them. Versus 
those patients who you can see here have got frequent exacerbation phenotype or severe exacerbation, um, and they are very symptomatic. So group D, where we may not only looking at either a single agent or dual agent labralama or labra ICS, or even you know, combinational um, or triple therapy labra labra ICS, depending on um, their uh, severity and the phenotype and the frequency of the exacerbation. So if the patient is um, respond to initial treatment, uh, then you will maintain. Um, if not, then you would perhaps start looking and stepping up or stepping down depending on, um, the, uh, on the treatment and the symptom. And you can see here the little star asterisks. Uh, interestingly, what are we looking at again? So again, it's interesting looking at eosinophil count again, because even though we, um, we define COPD uh, as it does not have a um, ref airflow reversibility, again, there are patients with COPD who have got the eosinophilic phenotype that perhaps um, then, you know, the corticosteroid will have a role and even potential new treatment, such as, for example, in Sutherland Hospital, we are actually in one of the, um, one of the uh, multi-center international trial looking at patients who've got moderate to severe COPD, frequent exacerbation, and has a eosinophil count more than 300. Uh, which is 0.3, and then looking at using one of the IL anti IL 5R medications that we looked at before to see whether that they may benefit uh, from less exacerbation. So you can see here, this will then look at whether or not this, they have dyspnea, is this major symptom, or is it exacerbation that we're looking at, and then we look at a different type of medication or combination of them to see what we can do um, to help improve. Besides the pharmacological treatment, then the most important thing to understand is also non-pharmacological treatment, which smoke cessation, of course, is um, very important, as well as pulmonary rehabilitation in any patient who got COPD. Uh, then it is important to really look at influenza vaccination, pneumococcus vaccination, and right now, COVID-19 vaccination to make sure that they're keeping up to date um, on this. So just going back in terms of severe COPD, these are really patients who got symptoms of repeated exacerbation despite optimizing the triple therapy, which is lava lama ICS. So there is, um, you can see in the table before, just two slides back up here, in terms of exacerbation, you can see here, there is a rough um, flumilast, um, and we talk about in a second, acifromycin. So the rofilumilast is a phosphodiesterase 4, a PDE4 inhibition inhibitor, which what has been shown is that it decreases inflammation and it reduces the risk of exacerbation in those patients who got severe COPD, um, especially if they got chronic bronchitis and frequent exacerbation. But one of the side effects is that it may be increased um, in at first um, psychiatric uh, reaction, and therefore it is usually important that we, um, we uh, warn the patient and then we um, observe the, um, the, medic, um, the effects of the medication on the patient. On the other arm, um, we're looking also at acifromycin, which is a macular antibiotic. This certainly has a role in some patients with cystic fibrosis and bronchiectasis. And there are lots of study looking at macrolide in non-cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis. But in asthma and COPD patients, um, you know, a macrolide antibiotic, a name acifromycin, also been shown that it can reduce the frequency of exacerbation in selected COPD patients especially those who are prone to exacerbation and cause severe diseases. So um, that's why it is also important that we consider that. In terms of supplemental oxygen, so that's another question that frequently get asked in terms of who um, should um, uh, be prescribed oxygen. Really, oxygen is really should be looked at as a drug and we should look at supplemental oxygen to patients who either are significantly hypoxic or they have got, um, you know, a corpum normale type, which is hypoxemia together with right heart failure or erythrocytosis. So you can see here, how do we define that? It's really looking at the arterial blood gases, uh, that the PAO2 less than 55, or if they're between 55 to 60 millimeter mercury, do they have signs of corpum normale, which is right heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, or erythrocytosis. <clears throat> 
then what we want to do is prescribe supplemental oxygen and titrate to keep saturation above or even 90%. But we will check usually in Australia 30 to 60 days to still see whether or not the patient may have recovered better or improved from the COPD or exacerbation. Um, and therefore, uh, we may um, be able to titrate down the flow or even stop it completely. Or we may be just to uh, looking at whether or not the patient just needs portable oxygen when they go uh, outside of the house for when the mobilization. Before I uh, you know, move on from oxygen, it's also important to recognize that some of our patients actually um, who got severe COPD and ILD um, could have a type, two, a chronic type two respiratory failure. So that means that the PaCO2 is more than 45 millimeter mercury. So whilst those patients may require supplemental oxygen, the oxygen titration would not be more than 90%, but would be a little bit lighter, um, a more, more tighter control between 88 to 92% so that we don't deliver too much oxygen, which may switch off um, the oxygen driven respiratory drive, given the baseline high per capnia. So last slide about COPD is just to understand where there may be other new things besides medical therapy and, um, and non-pharmacological therapy. Then there are and those people who got very severe advanced COPD um, as well as they got uh, or emphysema. Then there are um, possible um, surgical and non-surgical endobronchial um, valvular intervention uh, that, may, um, that may help. So, in firstly, when we um, look at these patients with severe COPD, we will look at whether they have got um, an emphysema predominant phenotype with significant hyperinflation. Um, and number two, we look at their age. Um, the look high, looking at hyperinflation for us is to look at the TLC, which we want to see that the TLC should be more than 100% as the total lung capacity for lung function, uh, greater than 100%. The, uh, residual volume should be more than 150%. So give us the RV over TLC ratio more than 120%. Um, and then that may mean that they may benefit from reduction of this excessive um, gas trapping. And then whether or not we, uh, what we do next is to look at the CT, looking at the parenchyma, whether they have got a large bulla that may benefit from a bullectomy or they may have got um, emphysema, and then what pattern is it? Do they have a heterogeneous pattern or more of a homogeneous pattern? And whether or not, when they look specifically at the ventilatory flow into those set, um, emphysema test chain uh, area, whether there is collateral ventilation, just for example, one subsegment of the lobe, whether they may have got um, ventilation from another part uh, or another subsegment or another lobe. Um, and in those cases, you know, may not necessarily work with certain type of intervention such as endobronchial valve, but a lung volume um, reduction surgery or coil may work instead. And so there are um, a lot of this kind of review nowadays, and there are only a few centers in, um, uh, in Sydney or New South Wales um, that really um, are pioneers in interventional pulmonology uh, as well as cardiothoracic um, uh, intervention for this that we look at. So, okay, so I'll take a pause and I'm happy to um, take some question on asthma and COPD before I look at the IOD. Hmm, we've got a couple, Professor Kwan. Someone's yep. asked, should we add pheno, F-E-N-O, which I presume is fractionally exhaled nitric oxide when getting spirometry for diagnosis and management of asthma? Yeah, so that is a very good question. Certainly my answer to that is yes. Why is that important? So in patients who've got eosinophilic um, airway inflammation, the, um, it, one of the byproducts or from the inflammation in the airway is the production of nitric oxide. And so from now we can collect the breath um, and then we can analyze it and it, it is called a pheno count. Um, and that when we compare to the environmental level, when the patient, you know, and it doesn't have, the patient doesn't have to do a forced maneuver, so it's much more easier to do. We can then see whether or not the level, if it's less than 15 parts per breath, it really means that there is a significant absence of eosinophilic air, airway inflammation, more than 50 parts per breath, significant presence of um, airway eosinophilic inflammation, and then somewhere in between, then it 
could be um, you know uh, baseline or it could be just uh, within the upper limit range of normal and that needs to be um, clinically reviewed. But in patients who you know we suspect asthma, that is very helpful to us if they got a very high phenol count. Noting that the phenol can also come from the nasal passive rate, doesn't have to be from the lower airway. So if someone got allergic rhinitis, could be though you can get them to put on nose clip, et cetera, to make them breathe out through the mouth to collect the lower airway instead. Um, but that can help us tailor the treatment. And also it can help us to monitor the treatment. So if the patient's still very symptomatically breathless or they have cough and wheeze, but when we look at the phenol count, we see that the, ear, um, the phenol is actually not high at all, then that, and they're telling us that there may be some other potential cause to the symptom and not an eosinophilic airway inflammatory responses. Um, and therefore, and, you know, and, um, so that just can guide treatment. So the, so the answer again is yes, we do do that. Um, and you know, that can be done in the Sutherland lab um, in, um, and also you know, in our first lab in the local region. Oh, thank you. Someone's asked, can anti-IL-5 drugs be used um, in patients who have recurring hives? Yeah, so urticaria um, and certainly has been looked at. So in a lot of the recurrent um, urticaria um, and patients with, with that, uh, it can potentially be looked at. It just look at the criteria, looking at the eosinophil, um, and the IgE level, because some of the patients, you know, have got recurrent hives, if they got a high per IgE, it may be that, that you know, that the, um, the Ig, the anti-IgE may be better suited. Um, certainly some of them, uh, there's certain criteria that needs to be fit in for PBS funding. Um, sometimes we just, you know, so that we just to check through. And somebody's asked that, um, could you comment on the higher potency flu vaccine called Fluzone for 60 plus age group? Is there a significant benefit over the subsidized free flu vaccines? Look, um, I mean, I personally have to say that I don't have a lot of um, uh, reading across those with the high potency flu vaccine. The, the only, everything about the vaccination, of course, is about the conjugates and power in terms of what component, um, as we know, when the vaccination, what they usually do is to look at uh, the, the type of the serotype of the influenza, um, usually in the northern hemisphere and what in the, south, um, in the previous season, and also in the southern hemisphere in the previous season for them to do the conjugate um, vaccine. So um, I, I usually said to my patient that, you know, that usually getting the influenza um, vaccination, um, if they can, uh, if they make sure they get it um, is good. They should really do is just to get it um, usually around April or so because the, the vaccine coverage um, usually work quite well within the first, you know, about three, four months um, after receiving the vaccine and that it may, it may wane the response after that time. Thank you. And you might want to answer this question in your next part of the talk. Someone's asked, is this from ice in helping patients with interstitial lung disease? Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll look at that um, in a second, but um, there are some suggestions that, that yes, it, it may have a role. Um, um, and, you know, in same as, as I said, wrong, wrong the non-cystic fibrosis type bronchiectasis. But, you know, whenever we look at giving patients a macro antibiotic, we have to be very careful, doesn't matter asthma or COPD patient as well, that we are um, looking at the resistance profile and whether there may be other um, condition in the patient's um, particular bronchiectasis that may cause us increased resistance in the population. Okay, now that's all at the moment. Thank you. That's right. Okay, so what we'll do is that we'll look at idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis um, and so, you know, firstly, office, uh, just to, for us to prompt ourselves to ask, you know, how do we approach a patient reference on exertion and chest x-ray that showed increased incisional marking. So, have, you know, if we have a think about in our usual practices, well, what do we do? Well, one of the many things that sometimes that we um, that we're now beginning to see, I should say, more and more in our population is actually um, this interstitial marking changes um, that not necessarily always uh, is um, infection or pulmonary edema, but in fact, more and more diagnosis of interstitial lung diseases are coming through. Uh, now, ILD can be caused by many different um, diseases. Um, it can be radiation induced. It could be occupational in induced and famously 
um, is really uh, in recent years in New South Wales is about um, city coasts, uh, especially with those um, stone cutters um, and uh, part of Sydney where there are large uh, number of small to medium sized businesses um, that make tabletop marble stone and granite stone um, that they have a significant increase uh, report of city coasts that has been happening and certainly you know we're seeing a number of them and it's now a reportable um, diseases um, and, uh, and and so that's make us obviously um, have to be careful uh, for um, some of our younger patients but besides then you know uh, those diseases then are also a cognitive tissue um, disease related ILD, but I want to focus this, this talk really today just on idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is a chronic progressive fibrosis in residual pneumonia, an unknown cause. Um, his, um, radiologically, what we're looking at is kind of like a, a pattern of UIP, and that will fit in with a histopathological change, which is really um, from the radiological perspective, the ground glass opacity, they will have some micronodules and cysts and kind of a mosaic attenuation across. Um, in the old days, we will um, frequently ask for a biopsy of sorts, but nowadays with um, significant improvement in radiological uh, technology with the high resolution CT scan, um, that can, um, an MDT frequently can make a confident diagnosis um, basing on that rather than just uh, requiring histopathology. Other things that we want to exclude certainly would be there's no evidence of other contributing factors such as asbestos exposure or hypersensitivity in immunitis and other chronic tissue diseases. Unfortunately, with IPF, um, there is no curative medication that we have at the moment, um, but there have been now two antifibrotic medication, which um, a lot of you may have come across or patients patient have been on it, uh, which has been shown to slow disease progression and decrease risk of all cause mortality. Um, and uh, that this is really um, the two medications we'll talk about in, in a second is perfinidone and intendinib. Um, and they are really for patients who've got mild or moderate IPF based on pulmonary function tests, and, and they should not have underlying liver diseases um, as the two medication can worsen um, uh, the liver function and due to medication side effects. So that would mean that we really want to look at the FVC, the force vital capacity, more than 50% predicted, and or the diffusion capacity or the gas transfer factor, DLCO, more than 35% are predicted. So this is just to show um, a, um, a reasoning in terms of this, uh, of the IPF side of things. Uh, and this is, you can see, you know, firstly uh, in here, this, um, this UIP is this abnormal proliferation of the mesenchymal cells with varying degree of fibrosis. In the past, this, the, the thought was that, well, if you give these patients um, prednisone um, uh, or, and then you can potentially uh, dampen down the inflammatory process and therefore um, help stop or arrest the process much earlier. But what has been found is the fact that there is really this abnormal proliferation and sometimes the fibrotic changes really would out, uh, uh, would be significant without much of an inflammatory process. And they're mediated by a number of pro-inflammatory cell types as well as cytokine. You see that a lot there. And therefore, the, um, th that's where a lot of the current medication um, uh, is being trying to look at to see whether they can modify um, some of this cytokine pathway to try to modify the disease and slow down the progression. But in terms of what could cause it for IPF, uh, it is not entirely clear. Um, there's a suspicion that perhaps there may be multiple different type of micro injury from either trauma or cigarette smoke or infectious agents, and even perhaps set up from the from this cytokine an autoimmune or um, or an inflammatory cascade that could continue to injure uh, the um, the epithelial cells and recruiting furthermore fibroblasts and other pro-inflammatory cytokine with a perpetual uh, perpetuation of this chronic inflammation. And then laying down more and more of the um, uh, interstitial collagens as well as fibroblasts. 
So um, to diagnose ILD nowadays, uh, it is really important um, that, uh, that you should really refer to either um, not just respiratory specialists or, or perhaps even you know, really just an ILD MDT. Often um, we will bring the case to an ILD MDT and you know, Sutherland does have an ILD um, clinic as well as an ILD MDT meeting with RPA that would a uh, multi-specialist um, panel looking at the patient's history, the clinical assessment, the lung function, um, the HRCT result, and, and whether there's any other um, serology or biopsy if they have. Then what that does is the MDT level is to look at um, the diagnosis and see whether or not uh, that they are confident to make a diagnosis of a particular entity or, you know, or if they cannot, it's difficult to classify. Now, if they have got a particular entity, for example, it could be connective tissue diseases type, um, then um, certainly then we'll be looking at targeting treatment for that particular type of connective tissue disease. Um, it could be rheumatoid arthritis, it could be systemic sclerosis um, or Sjogren, et cetera. And then you would start treatment, you'll watch and wait, you will see, um, look, monitoring the disease progression by following up with lung function, clinical assessment, as well as um, the HRCT. Uh, and then if they got progress um, or not, and then you uh, look at the next step of treatment. Uh, but in terms of the IPF patients now, so we've got mild to moderate diseases, then we will look at perfinidone intentinib. There are some more clinical trial. In effect, right now, with patients who got actually mild to moderate diseases or even severe diseases, um, and they, um, in the moderate diseases space, if they cannot tolerate or um, the disease progressed despite uh, both of the antifibrotic agents, then there is now two um, clinical trials that we can still um, enroll patients into looking at new medications. But regardless of the two, we will usually will start patient on either one, and that's really patient preferences and understanding the side effect profile. Then we'll evaluate them usually about six months to look at the lung function as well as the CT scan to see whether uh, the FVC and DLCO reduction can be stabilized. But if they not, or they have worsening symptoms, um, or they're radiologically worsened, then we're really starting to evaluate either we continue or we swap to the other one, or we look at clinical trial, we address other factors. If they are um, uh, obviously of a younger um, age, then consideration the early referral to a lung transplantation unit which is at St. Vincent Hospital um, so that we can be evaluated. But in terms of severe diseases, um, obviously in those patients who perhaps fit in the criteria for lung transplantation referral, that should be it. Um, and then the, otherwise to review for clinical trial inclusion um, and the supportive care. So just to explain this to any fibrotic agent, Nintendinib, it is a receptor blocker for multiple different um, tyrosine kinases. What it does is that it, um, uh, uh, it immediate which the platelet, so such as, for example, platelet-derived growth factor or VEGF or fibroblast growth factor. And what all this does is that they obviously cause fibrogenic growth. So by blocking it, we're trying to slow that process down. Patient on the Nintendinib uh, and perfinidone, the major um, side effects um, that, and often the cause for cessation of treatment is intolerance due to GI side effects. So diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting is very common. Elevation in liver function test is also very common. And hence, when we start patient on Nintendinib, we do um, look at the liver function test uh, monthly for three months and every three months um, uh, over time. Um, with the PBS um, criteria, they do need to make sure that the patient does not have progression um, to continue on this treatment or um, they have to show that there is benefit beyond 12 months. In terms of perfinidone, this is a medication um, that actually uh, inhibits the transforming um, growth factor beta or TGF beta, uh, which stimulates the collagen synthesis. Um, so uh, what collagen synthesis does is, you know, um, uh, is that it's obviously it causes the lung fibroblast um, and then they get extracellular collagen fibroformation and then causes that um, uh, thickening and the growth in the, in the tissue. 
For perfinidone, um, the, the major side effects besides the GI side effect, you can see here nausea and diarrhea is also again very common. But fatigue, rash is uh, and photosensitivity is is um, is also uh, a very common side effect. Um, and again, there's another reason why sometimes a patient would um, decline um, to continue. So that is a very quick summary update on um, ILD. Uh, any question before we look into COVID-19? Um, I don't have any questions on ILD, but someone has just asked um, one about COPD. Yep. Just, just to clarify, when we diagnose COPD on spirometry, we are looking for a lack of response to bronchodilator, but then therapeutically we still use SABRs for patients with COPD. Is that correct? Yeah, so yes, yeah. so the first important thing we're looking for is a lack of reversibility. Well, lack of reversibility is one of the many things that we look for, I should clarify, because um, in a well-controlled asthma or doesn't have exacerbation, you may do a spirometry and a patient may not necessarily have bronchodilator reversibility. Um, so and sometimes that it becomes a little bit tricky, but certainly in a patient who is 50 years old and above, um, if they have got very classical symptoms of um, breathlessness or wheeze or cough, um, they have got, um, they do not demonstrate uh, variable airflow obstruction over time, um, and uh, they um, also does not have any of the allergic type phenotype. Um, they have been exposed to the allergen that we talk about, especially particular smoking. Uh, then, um, then yes, that will be more likely to have the COPD type of diagnosis rather than asthma. Um, and what treatment would I start the patient like that lead to ABCD assessment would depending on um, what symptom they have. So if they have very minimal symptom, they have very mild diseases, um, and they do not have any uh, significant exacerbation, then you are correct. A SABA is, um, is adequate. But if they have very little symptoms, very little exacerbation, but they have a eosinophil um, that is raised more than 0.3, um, even though there may not be a variable airflow obstruction demonstrated on the spirometry, I would most likely be giving them the B, which is a SABA plus ICS or LABA plus ICS, depending on the symptoms. Um, uh, as the starting point. Thank you. Um, the only other one is, I don't know if you've answered this, when, when is an antifibrotic agent administered? Yep. So the antifibrotic agent will be administered if we, number one, confirm or um, have a high index of confirmation or a low confirmation um, probability of IPF. So we will firstly confirm ILD, exclude all the other possibilities such as um, chronic tissue diseases or um, asbestos. Um, and then we will bring the patient to the MDT to get a confirmation um, from the panel. Uh, and then we will then uh, discuss with the, and if they, if their uh, DLCO is more than 35% and their FVC is more than 50%, so they got mild to more diseases, then we will look at consideration of an um, of antifibrotic. Right, no, that's all. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay, so we will look at in terms of COVID-19. Now, um, obviously, we will uh, understand this, obviously, of the vast amount of information that there is. Um, so what I would really want to focus on, well, how do you assess severity and also what resources do we use? Uh, I have listed a few different um, pages here, and I've sent some of the links, and, and that's really quite useful information. So firstly, the New South Wales Tech um, Group, um, constant update in terms of the current COVID-19 medicine, conscious that you're gonna have a COVID-19 medicine talk next week, so I'm not going to focus too much on that, uh, but that is a very variable resources, frequently updated, it's a live document um, with time. And similarly, the National COVID-19 Clinical Evidence Task Force um, is, a, uh, is also another excellent um, uh, resources uh, that would, again, another live document, and that will show a lot of the different um, changes in terms over time um, and what medication uh, and some information about vaccine, et cetera, as well. Because we are obviously in Southeast uh, and Cessalate, then the Cessalate COVID-19 resources page is also very important, especially about community care, the community care model um, that Cessalate uh, has um, in conjunction with the PHN. And then the, um, the ACI, which is the New South Wales Health Agency of Clinical Innovation, also have significant in, 
um, important information about model of care uh, for different type of any um, anti SAR, um, anti COVID 19 monoclonal antibodies for adults, for pediatric, etc. Um, that's also very good information. It's also some information sheet as well. And I think um, the, our GP in, our, um, in the PHN has also received um, recently some information because of the two new oral anti um, uh, antibody, monoclonal antibody that came out um, that, um, that will have some resources around consent form, patient information sheet, and, uh, and the pathway of how to select each. So understanding those, and, and I think I also send to everyone in terms of the BMJ, which is a very useful, again, a live guideline, um, just as new drugs could in. And also it looks at all the, all each of the medications that has been studied um, in terms of um, ICU admission, whether they improve them or not, um, whether they uh, increase mortality, uh, et cetera. And that's very important because it has got medication like ivermectin and those things into it. And that's very clearly, um, I can understand it. If we have time at the end, I'll show you the website. So risk assessment. So the most important thing about risk assessment of a patient who has got COVID and a lot of times patient may not necessarily understand this part or they may not necessarily click on websites from New South Health or our Cesslet to look through, but we separate patients to mild, moderate, severe, and critical. Um, so when we look at, you know, patients who got mild um, um, COVID, which are really those patients who are managed in the community. Um, so this is uh, those patients who got no or mild symptoms only, such as fever, cough, or sore throat, malaise, and they're not breathless or they're not difficulty or exertion. I mean, there's, you know, if they've done a, a clinical assessment, there's no evidence of, you know, kind of um, low respiratory tract infection signs, such as sputum production, the crackles in the chest, Etc. And the saturation also is above 94% at rest. Now, if they have a degree of hypoxemia um, uh, or they have evidence of low respiratory tract infection, then they then they we start to look at moderate diseases or even severe, depending on how severe those um, lung infiltrates or the respiratory rate and the, or the hypoxemia is. And that obviously increases the risk. And in patients who got moderate to critical often they will be managed um, either very close in the community or majority will actually be uh, in hospital, uh, even for a short period of time. So in terms of the risk factor for poor outcome, um, we know that age is an important um, factor um, and uh, lower for those who are um, of our Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander or First Nation people unvaccinated or partially vaccinated people. Um, uh, again, they have got higher risk factor. It is also uh, important to understand what the definition of so-called partially vaccinated is. Um, you know, it, it often would look at now is if they only have two doses of, um, of the COVID-19 vaccine, how long has it been since the last dose that has been given? Um, then of course, if we are concerned because they are have difficulty access to care, they're in a remote area or they live alone and they're frail, then perhaps, or they have other comorbidities, then perhaps they may have got more risk factor poor outcome and they may either need to be monitored closely if they have got um, mild diseases or perhaps even in the hospital if they got more plus diseases. And other comorbidities such as lung diseases, cardiovascular diseases, type two diabetes, immunocompromised condition and pregnancy. So in, in terms of immunocompromise, um, it could be primary or acquired deficiency and um, malignancy, of course, is especially hematological malignancy. If they um, have got a post-transplantation, um, if they got HIV, uh, if they have, are on immunosuppressive therapy, such as you know, um, um, corticosteroid uh, for you know, a period of time they receiving chemotherapy or radiotherapy, uh, and other type of biologics and uh, DMAT, then they will be they be looked at as immunocompromised, and why is that important? We'll look at it in a second. So this is just a, um, a an excellent um, article that's recently published in Nature, which I also sent I think a link to for those of you who are like interested to read. It's very um, very comprehensive, but in particular we borrowed this diagram because it look at what we believe are the pathogen do um, that are potential driver of the pathogenesis of COVID-19. Um, and therefore, you know, the, 
immunomodulatory approaches that we have at the moment targeting um, each of these in, uh, and um, why um, those different potential um, treatment coming um, and what the current treatment are. Uh, and as I said, you, you will have a talk about COVID-19 medication, um, but you can see here uh, because of the uh, of the way that the pathogenesis um, from the viral replication um, to obviously viral um, entry into the cell. And uh, you can see there are lots of different pathway and medication that we look at to look at anti-entry or anti-viral release, uh, protease inhibitor that has been tried or anti-RNA polymerases um, all the way to modulating our host um, factor such as the BKT inhibitors or the IL-1, IL-6. Um, the JK inhibitor um, and other immunology approaches has been looked at. Of, in here, you can see some have now been deemed not to be successful, some have, um, and that's what we are using. Okay, so in terms of this, you know, the treatment side of things, as I hinted before, there's this drug treatment for COVID-19, which is the Living Systemic Review, the BMJ, um, so those, those two webs, um, those two link, it will be very handy. And if you just need this, just let me know. We can resend that again. I'm just going to now very briefly, um, given that you're going to have a talk on this later, just to talk about some of the antiviral entry medication. Um, so one of the ones is initially looking at is a chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, which is an anti-malarial drug. And the other one is a, C, uh, is a chloroquine analog. Um, initially used, obviously, malaria, but also in treating autoimmune diseases. The thought is, if um, the hydroxychloroquine can increase the endosome and pH level, it can inhibit the fusion, um, and therefore it stops the virus from entering. Uh, whereas the um, chloroquine can interfere with the binding by inhibiting that dichloxylation of the ACE2 inhibitor. But um, unfortunately, the studies have shown that it doesn't decrease the 28 days mortality, but it does in fact increase the length of stay and risk of intervention, and that's why it is not recommended. What about other drugs looking at um, the uh, uh, entry levels? So um, COVID-19 uses the spike glycoprotein, so S protein to enter, and so there are medication to look at. Uh, what happens is we, we look at this um, to um, uh, effect or affect the spike glycoprotein. So these are the maps. So the one that we are probably now looking at is the um, region CoV2, uh, COV2, which is the um, DEV map plus the Casirismin map. This is one of the four new medications that we can now look at. And what this does, uh, what this medication do is that it um, can have a greater effect in those patients who test a negative uh, for serum antibodies at baseline but it does have serious hypersensitive reaction um, as well as infusion-related reaction. Um, but this is one of the four new medications that we can use in patients who got mild COVID uh, within five days. So moving from the anti-entry anti medication, what about stopping the medication, uh, for, um, medication that look at stopping the virus from replicating? Well, um, from the, um, the SARS-CoV-2 genome, approximately two third comprises um, those kind of o, um, uh, ORFs. You can see in the top part um, that encodes two different polyproteins. So they are polyprotein 1A and polyprotein 1AB. And then they are further degraded into the also different type of NSPs that is there. there. So um, with this in mind, there are the, one of the important NSP that uh, people are looking at, um, um, is the NSP12, um, which you can see down in, in here. Um, this part, I'm not sure you may see the pointer, but you can see in the, uh, in the middle part, it says non-structural protein, and there's NSP12 that has been looked at. Um, that uh, protein is specifically present in the virus and without the whole cell homolog, so it is thought that it may be a very superior target to develop a safer and more efficient treatment approach. And there are some of these farm, some of the genome um, and the key amino acid, and also has similar to other viruses, um, such as um, uh, the other type of RNA viruses, such as hepatitis C and Zika viruses and other type of coronaviruses, and therefore uh, re repurposing previous other drugs has been trialed. 
Um, so what they have been done is to repurpose some of those drugs and try for COVID-19. Um, and in particular, which may have a role is remdesivir, which uh, remdesivir, we target the NSP12. Um, and what has been shown in the trial is that it reduces the time to clinical recovery in patients with severe um, diseases and has improved outcome in hospitalized patients with moderate COVID-19 compared to center of care. And therefore, in patients with moral diseases that they get admitted into hospital, remdesivir um, would be a suitable medication to commence. So in terms of the medication that we look at targeting the whole cells, we talk about on the other side of the graph before, that look at the immunomoderatory factor. So can we look at um, drugs that will perhaps um, affect um, the um, uh, the uh, immune response um, so that it does not cause the lung injury and other organ failure. We know that when the, uh, when the virus replicates, um, it can uh, causes a significant amount of um, cytokine release and pro-inflammatory cytokines. So this is called a cytokine storm. Um, and in this case, it usually will affect you know, the lung, um, the kidney um, and, and the liver um, commonly. And so the thought is that, well, if you, we can dampen that cytokine storm, then perhaps we can delay or reduce the severity. And certainly that has been shown that the um, corticosteroid um, uh, treatment works in this case in patients got moderate to severe diseases. And that's why um, you know, dexamethasone is often used, but you can use other medication rather than dexamethasone. You can use um, mifoprednisolone, you can use prednisone, you can use um, uh, hydroxy, uh, hydrocorticosteroid, but it's just a dose equivalent um, to, um, uh, early in the early stage. So currently, we patients who got um, moderate to severe COVID-19, we usually, um, if they require oxygen supply, we'll give not just corticosteroid, but also remdesivir. Furthermore, there are two other medications. They're called the anti-inflammatory cytokines, IL-1 and IL-6, as well as the jack signal pathway. And in, through this, we now have um, two new uh, medications that we can use because the, and it, um, it has been shown that by blocking this anti-inflammatory cytokine on the jack signal, um, that is certain, uh, that has been shown that it reduces um, the severity and the, um, the respiratory decompensation that has been shown. So the two medications that we're looking at is the tocilizumab and sarilumab, um, that is anti-IL-6R uh, and baracitinib, which is the JAK inhibitors. Um, and so those are often being used again in um, uh, hospitalized patients. The tocilizumab and sarilumab can be used for patients who are, um, who are intubated um, or an imminent risk of intubation, whereas the baracitinib is usually reserved for those who are non-intubated and they got moderate um, disease. So they can be given a patient who are got uh, are on non-invasive ventilation in the hospital setting. And all these have, um, the IL-1 and IL-6 receptor um, inhibitor has been shown to have significant benefit of survival um, and to be given, whereas the JAK2 signal pathway to baracitinib, uh, what has been shown is that a patient who receive it has improved clinical recovery than those who re, um, receive placebo um, by about a day, especially those who got um, on NIV. So um, in summary, what about other type of the COVID-19 disease modifying drugs? So this is just a summary of what we now currently have in our arsenal. So firstly, we talk about this now, the region COF-2, so the Ronaprif or the Casifrifimab plus Imdefimab. So um, we usually would want to suggest this to start within seven days of symptom, onset in patients with, um, uh, with COVID-19 who do not require oxygen, so mild, um, and have one or more risk factor, which we shown before for disease progression, or they got seronegative adult hospitalized or moderate to critical COVID-19. Dexamethasone, patient who receive um, oxygen, including mechanical ventilated, would usually suggest up to 10 days. But we won't usually give um, dexamethasone or corticosteroid to patients who do not require oxygen. Um, and uh, in terms of baracitinib, so uh, this will be suggested in patients um, hospitalized with COVID-19 who require supplemental oxygen, but not mechanical ventilation, the degree of side effects. 
and sarilumab um, in those who require high flow oxygen, um, non invasive ventilation, or invasive mechanical ventilation. And tocilizumab, um, which of um, which this um, the early um, 2000 and sorry, 2019, 2020, we used that quite frequently in, uh, for those patients who require oxygen and intubated and with the systemic inflammation together with dexamethasone and remdesivir, those which require oxygen but does not require non-invasive or invasive ventilation. So then the other one that has been used um, during the uh, uh, Omicron is the Zotrofimab, which is um, uh, that this medication we should want to usually start within five days of symptom onset in those who got unvaccinated um, and who got COVID-19 do not require oxygen and who have one or more risk factor for disease progression. Now we have got two new oral agents that have started, it's been TJ approved, there's Monupiravir, um, which is like, uh, the Jeff Rio and so Nermatrevia uh, plus Ritonavir and Paxlovid. So again, they usually start with a five-day symptom onset in those who are unvaccinated um, and who do not require oxygen. So there is a lot to know and there's a lot to remember. It's very, very difficult. Um, so what I would suggest to that is that this, this um, says that COVID-19 community management model, which um, I think is no longer in draft form, but firstly, it is important to look at referral. So it could be from the community. So those when you got positive PCR or, or registered positive RET, so patient can either self-referral um, or it can be referred in from the um, from a GP or other state support line. And then the, um, the, the COVID-19 community management team, so the CTAC team would then assess the patient uh, low, moderate, or high, and then they would then um, suggest whether they just self-manage, would provide support, or um, they may um, be referred to the virtual consult, um, which would uh, then uh, potentially provide them with um, uh, home-based pulse oximeter and phone apps um, to, uh, to be monitored for the duration of their self-isolation period, or if they have got high risk, um, then either perhaps either they self-manage at home or they may be referred in for the telehealth assessment clinic to, re to look at whether they may um, fit in. Uh, so they may um, satisfy the criteria for sotrofimab um, if they've got mild diseases or they may require hospitalization or um, other services. Just to, um, because of the four now agent that we can look at, so trophimab, um, the uh, um, region COF2, as well as the two oral agent, uh, it's important that Sutherland, they, um, they are dispensed via the hospital pharmacy. Sutherland will only supply those oral medicine to those who are eligible if they present to the hospital, um, uh, our operational ED are admitted. Um, then they test the positive and unable to obtain this uh, within five days of symptom onset. Otherwise, uh, we would um, the uh, the district's recommendation is that the GP refer or patient to refer directly to the St George vaccination hub, which will supply all the oral COVID nineteen medicine for the whole of Seslet. Um, and so you, there's a set of documents that needs to be filled in until an assessment. Um, and there's a whole folder I think that was sent through. And then you can add an email or fax to the St. George Hub um, as stated there. Okay, so I will stop there and just ask some questions. Um, right, thank you. Um, someone's asked anti-inflammatory cytokines are available in Australia. Anti-inflammatory cytokines yeah, yeah. The, oh, um, you mean for COVID-19 oh, um, jack signal pathway yeah, yeah. so they are so they are so there's very 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 limited supply of tocilizumab still um, luckily at the moment um, not many patients um, obviously are has severe COVID-19 we still see them especially those who are unvaccinated 
most patients are you know, in the mild severity, but where it's, need, uh, where it's needed, then yes, um, they are still in supply. There is a stockpile from the state um, and in each of district pharmacies that usually have one or two um, that will be dispensed when the treating team in the hospital um, in consultation are the respiratory ID um, deemed it um, to need it uh, when the patient is mechanically ventilated. Yeah. Mm. And someone said, does it mean that we assume it's Omicron and can get them to access treatment in the first five days? I think it's about 80% Omicron at the moment, isn't it? That's right, yes. Yeah, and mm -hmm. yes, you can. Yeah, yep, you can. So, um, uh, look, I, I think during December and January, things were happening so fast and rapid um, that the communication was maybe perhaps not as clear and, the, and I suppose all, you know, lots of patients are very confused about what whether they can access or not. And, um, and and who did they go to? But certainly, yes, uh, in, it, it doesn't really matter what variant it is. Um, if the patient has got one of those risk factor, um, and give me one second, what I'll do, I'll just stop sharing and I'll put on the web page, which shows the um, medication here. I'll just realign this again. Okay, so can you see that? So um, this is the ACI um, document now. This is what the state health would, um, would follow, that within five days of symptom onset, no oxygen requirement, reduced immunity, so unvaccinated or not fully vaccinated uh, or overdue, and there's a target guideline or immunocompromise, and then, then you can um, certainly um, send in the referral uh, and then that will be reviewed in terms of whether or not we will look at sotrofimab or the um, casarifimib plus imidacloprid that's the region COF2 or those of the two oral medication and this is the bottom here so this can this again we can also share with everyone oh thank you um we do have one question it takes a little while to come um, for me to see it. Just about interstitial lung disease, how similar is the approach to interstitial fibrosis and systemic sclerosis? Um, uh, well, look, IOD is a very heterogeneous, broad umbrella. Um, so obviously systemic sclerosis can cause IOD. And in those patients who have got systemic sclerosis and IOD, the treatment uh, would usually be controlling the contact tissue diseases fundamentally. Um, but in circumstances where their um, contact tissue diseases may actually be relatively well managed, but they are, um, the pulmonary um, side is progressing, then we will and um, you should look at the medication modification to further dampen and control because the driver is the same. But so, so we did got connective tissue diseases and IOD, majority of the time it will be, con it will, we, will, um, we will brand it as a connective tissue IOD, which means that you, you will treat the underlying connective tissue disease. Mm. Oh, thank you. And thank you for such an interesting, comprehensive talk. Yeah, now back to you, Lydia. Uh, thank you, Janine. And uh, thank you, Associate Professor Benjamin Korn. Uh, very comprehensive, very busy presentation, but um, uh, very on time as well. Um, I would like to invite um, our next speaker for the uh, update on the health pathways. Um, uh, Dr. Martina Gleeson, uh, local GP, clinical lead, general practice, Southeastern Sydney Health Pathways, regional clinical advisor, Health Pathways, New South Wales. Thank you, Martina. Thanks very much, everyone. Can you see the screen properly, Lydia? Yes, thank you. Excellent. Um, thanks, Ben. And uh, so today I'm just going to show you uh, where on health, like what pathways you can find on our Health Pathways site that are relevant to Ben's talk and talk a little bit about uh, the COVID-19 pathway and uh, give you a little bit of information about how we've collaborated with the Agency for Clinical Innovation and the Ministry of Health so that you can rely on the information on the Health Pathways being as up to date as possible. Um, obviously, in our PHN, we have uh, two local health pathways teams. We have the Sydney um, Health Pathways site and the Southeast Sydney. Um, so these are the uh, 
you can QR code in using these QR codes or you can copy the web addresses from this. I would suggest that you use Google Chrome to access Health Pathways. And the reason I'd suggest that is because once you save the password, then if you, no matter where you're using Google Chrome, whether it's on your phone or whether it's on your desktop at work, uh, it will remember your password and that will make it much easier to access um, the health pathways when you're wanting to use them. So uh, the South East and Sydney login detail, the username is SE Sydney, the password is healthcare. Um, the South, the Sydney one, the username um, is connected and the password is healthcare, but you can actually use uh, the South East Sydney uh, login for the Sydney pathway and vice versa, because we figure seeing that we're in the same PHN, we want to make it easy for people who have patients who are in both areas to access the pathways that are appropriate for their patient. Uh, this is a new slide. Um, to, we've decided that we need to help people find what they're looking for. So um, if you want to do a quick search, say for citrovimab, um, you can see here if you type in a word search at the top of the bar, um, and then you can choose the relevant pathway for what you're searching for. Uh, and then um, if you click on the expand all button and, and then use control F or for um, Mac users, I think it's command F, and then type in the word that you're searching for. That will help you to rapidly identify in the pathway everywhere that word exists, which makes it easier for you to find specifically what you're looking for. So for example, uh, we've used Sotrovimab as an example here, but uh, if you had a patient who was pregnant and you weren't sure if they represented a particular issue in COVID and you weren't sure what to do, um, you could, type in pregnancy in the search term or pregnant in the search term, and that would help you find uh, where we've got specific information um, about women who are pregnant who have active COVID infection. Um, I wanted to also point out where you'll find the information on the antivirals and the monoclonals. So in the COVID-19 active case management, um, this is uh, a screenshot of the pathway when it's all collapsed down. Um, so you go to the part that says COVID-19 care, initial and ongoing uh, telehealth monitoring during illness. And then you go to point six. Uh, and that whole point is about the medications that we can organise for our patients uh, that are being used in the community, uh, including um, sotrovimab and um, the Paxlovid and the Legevrio. Um, I don't have information on the Kazarivimab and Indevimab um, on the pathway. That's a deliberate choice because uh, we took it out when um, Omicron was becoming more and more common because uh, there's doubt about how effective it is in the Omicron variant. So we didn't want to confuse things. But to be honest, the decision about which monoclonal antibody to give is up to the local um, infectious diseases team that are uh, part of the um, part of the CTAC team. So your job is to identify who's appropriate for those medications and to then contact the CTAC team uh, to refer in. And then it's their job to decide which of the monoclonal antibodies um, can be given. Um, but you don't need to ask their permission for to prescribe an antiviral, um, although it's you know might be worthwhile having a discussion because. Um, it might be that the patient is more suitable for a monoclonal antibody rather than an antiviral. Um, there are some quite tricky um, parts of prescribing the antivirals. Um, the most effective one, which is Paxlovid, has an extensive list of um, interact drug interactions. And you really should be checking the drug interactions for everything the patient takes. And we have um, a COVID 19 drug interaction checker on the pathway so that you can access that resource. The list of medications that interact with Paxlovid is longer than we could write. Um, it would have taken up the whole pathway. And Molnupiravir, which is um, a bit less effective, um, has uh, a 
a problem, it's a contraindicated in uh, pregnancy and also requires avoidance of conceiving by both the male and the female partners, both during treatment and for three months afterwards because it's pregnancy category D and teratogenic. So that's something to remember. Um, I'll be giving a lot more information on um, on the processes, who is um, eligible for the antivirals and the monoclonals and the processes for prescribing in next Monday night's webinar, uh, where we'll be presenting with um, one of the geriatricians from St Vincent's and some of the hospital pharmacists. So you'll have a really good idea of the lay of the land um, from that webinar, um, or you can go to the Health Pathway today and read point six. Um, so just to end up and let you know the pathways that we've got live at the moment for on South East and Sydney related to tonight's talk um, are listed here, asthma in adults, COPD, dyspnea, um, spirometry testing and interpretation, the whole COVID-19 suite, post-COVID-19 conditions and the respiratory requests, which is how you identify where the services are in our area. Um, to um, when you get to the point where you need to refer the patient. Um, our respiratory pathways are under review this year, which means that we're looking at them to see what updates have occurred and we'll be bringing them into line with um, updates. So we'll be adding some of the information about um, the, the higher level drugs that Ben was talking about tonight into the pathways in the next six months. Uh, and we're also currently working on interstitial lung disease and a suite of lung cancer pathways. Um, Sydney has asthma in adults. Uh, they're currently reviewing chronic cough in adults, dyspnea, COPD, and of course the COVID-19 suite, post-COVID conditions and the respiratory requests and many more. Um, I'd also like to invite you to nominate yourself for our GP colleague referrals page. Um, these are the areas of, uh, of areas that we, uh, we would like to list our, G risk, list our GP colleagues um, who might be specialising in particular procedures where you might share care with that GP so that the GP, that GP can provide their specialised care for your patient and then send them back to you when um, they've done the job. Um, so, and there's the contact detail for Sue Baker on that. And I'd also, um, you, you can also go to the GP colleague referral page and use the feedback button and um, that will open up uh, an email to our team and then you can nominate yourself to be included in that page. And these are the contact details for the program managers and project officers for both of the teams. And does, again, on each pathway, you're able to send feedback using the feedback icon at the bottom of the page. Um, so if you find a mistake or you found the pathway really helpful or you have a question, uh, please feel free to use the feedback because uh, we really like to be responsive and make sure that the pathways are um, relevant to the needs that you have.